Welcome to this event entitled Libyan General Elections 2021, a discussion series with Libyan leaders. This event is offered in both English and Arabic on the event page. And event page. Please choose the player which works best for you. The event is being live streamed and recorded. I am Michael Yaffe, Vice President of the Middle East and North Africa Center at, U at the United States Institute of Peace, USIP. For those of you who have attended prior USIP events, let me welcome you back. And for those of you who are new to USIP, welcome. And permit me to say a few words about the Institute. USIP was created by an act of Congress in 1984 to serve as an independent, nonpartisan institute dedicated to peace building, particularly the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of violent conflict. We conduct research, training, and convening, and work in conflict zones around the world with a presence in 16 countries. USIP has been working in Libya since 2012, where we conduct research for informing policymakers and practitioners about conflict-related issues and help build a local peace infrastructure to strengthen the capacity of key stakeholders like women and youth and institutions like the Ministry of Justice. USIP recently began a project with funding from the US State Department to increase election security by working with the Ministry of Interior to strengthen the police's ability to partner and problem solve within communities. Now I would like, in light of the upcoming elections set to begin next month, Today's event is a timely conversation with Dr. R uh, Arif Ali Anai. This event is the third in a series of moderated discussions USIP is hosting to provide a neutral platform for Libyans seeking to play a critical role, including potentially high office in a future permanent government. Recordings of the previous interviews with Fatih Bashaga and Fatou Lamin are available at the USIP website. The elections are scheduled for the end of December are not just any elections. They will provide Libyans with an opportunity to have their say in the representational government, including the first elected president of Libya. Making sure that the elections are fair and safe will be very important. For those of you who are interested in learning more about preventing election violence, we would like to invite you to take one of USIP's online courses on the subject. Available through our online global campus at www.usipglobalcampus.org. The Preventing Election Violence full length and micro courses in English are available for free access. Anyone who would like to have these course materials in Arabic, we hope to have that up online soon. In the meantime, please reach out to, the, to us at the USIP, at the academy at usip.org to discuss receiving a copy of these Arabic language materials before they, are, before they are officially put online. Elections, of course, are only the beginning of the journey to set Libya on a path to deal with complex issues of governance and sovereignty. Issues like the presence of mercenaries in the country, foreign meddling, institutional disunity, minority inclusion, transitional justice, and other matters are to be decided by a represent representational government. In the spirit of fostering dialogue, each speaker we host will have several minutes to give opening remarks that address some of these issues, after which I will ask them questions in order to explicate their positions and views. I would try to ask the same questions to all speakers in this discussion series, so people can hear and compare the unique responses. After that, I will turn to the audience members for their questions. For the audience watching online, we encourage you to send questions for Dr. Naid through the chat box. We can also, you can also send questions through Twitter at hashtag LibyaElectionsUSIP, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Now, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Anaid. Dr. Anaid is a former Libyan ambassador to the United Arab Emirates and is currently chairman of Kamal Research and Media Company and chairman of the Libya Institute of Advanced Studies. During the Libyan Revolution, 
He was also the chief operations manager of the Libyan stabilization team. He has taught and lectured in Islamic theology, logic, and spirituality at the restored Uthman Krishna Madrasa in Tripoli. He is a senior advisor to the Cambridge Interfaith Program, a fellow at the Royal, uh, Royal Al-Abat Institute in Jordan, and a member of the Board of Advisors of the Templeton Foundation. He was a professor at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome and the International Institute for Islamic Thought and Civilization in Malaysia. He previously headed an information technology company based in the UAE and Libya, and he received a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering, a Master's of Philosophy of Science, and a PhD in hermeneutics from the University of Galaf in Canada. He has published on a wide range of topics from Libyan-Russian relations to ISIS in Libya to the theology of neighborhoodness. With that, let me turn the floor over to Dr. Naib, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, greetings. And uh, thank you very much to uh, USIP for this opportunity. Uh, these uh, neutral platforms for discussion uh, are immensely important for democracy. Uh, yesterday, there was an initiative uh, initiated by a, a couple of uh, young Libyans at the Libya desk that saw the meeting of uh, several um, candidates to the presidency or aspirants to the presidency of Libya. And it was the first of its kind. Uh, this platform of USIP also is the first of its kind. And uh, we are uh, in a period of uh, what uh, Han Hannah Arndt calls the natality, a, a new beginning. And uh, these uh, platforms are, are very, very important. And I am grateful to be given an opportunity to participate with you in this uh, exciting uh, uh, experiment in many ways. Uh, I am glad that uh, I have been preceded by two colleagues, uh, fellow uh, candidates to the presidency of Libya. Uh, I wish them well. I wish all my colleagues uh, well. Uh, the very fact that we have an election is a, a joyous moment. Uh, yesterday, when I submitted uh, my papers for the candidacy for the presidency, it was uh, probably the most exciting moment of my life. I, I felt uh, a particular joy at the fact that we have presidential elections and parliamentarian elections. For your information, these presidential elections uh, have, have been uh, postponed and postponed for multiple uh, years now. Uh, since 2011, we've only had parliamentarian elections, and the presidential elections kept uh, getting postponed. In uh, 2014, uh, decree number five uh, established that there should be direct presidential elections, but they have been constantly postponed year after year. Uh, even after the Paris Accord uh, in 2018, summer of 2018, uh, when it was decided that elections will happen on, in December 2018. Again, uh, they, they, there have been postponements and procrastinations. And the reason for these postponements of procrastinations are very simple. It is basically what I call tyranny of the minority. You know, John Stuart Mill in his famous works, uh, you know, warned of tyranny of the majority in democracy. What we've had in Libya is tyranny of the minority, a minority that's benefiting from the chaos that we are living in. And they have been able to postpone and procrastinate over the elections for multiple years. So it is a particular joy to actually finally have these elections and uh, a great honor to, to have an opportunity to uh, uh, participate in them. I look forward to uh, these elections. I hope that they will be fair and balanced and transparent and well monitored and that the results will be respected uh, by everyone concerned. Uh, as a candidate, I, I hereby commit and I have done it in writing to respect the results of the election, no matter uh, what the results are. And I hope that all our colleagues will do the same and that everybody will uphold their commitments uh, in order to uh, give Libya a, 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 an amazing opportunity to live a life of democracy and to choose uh, its leadership for the very first time uh, in, in its very long and, and uh, arduous history. Um, uh, I am running for the presidency on a platform that is actually not a, a single person's creation, but actually the ideation of a community of young women and men from Libya and also 
with the help of various international consultants and, and friends and advisors, we have been able to put together a uh, vision for the country, which is called Ihya Libya. Ihya is a word that means reviving. It comes from the word for life. Ihya Libya is reviving Libya. And it is uh, our vision is published on ihyalibya.com. I hope you will get a chance to, to, con to consult the website to see the details of our vision. Uh, and this vision was developed through uh, our institute, which is called the Libya Institute for Advanced Studies. Over a number of years, it is an open project, which is uh, continuously being improved and, uh, and re-articulated. And uh, I am very uh, happy to uh, say that this uh, vision is also adopted by uh, multiple uh, parliamentarian candidates, so it's not only uh, the, the platform for my own candidacy, but, but it's actually shared by several young people who are uh, running for the parliament as well. Uh, with, uh, without any uh, further ado, let me just tell you uh, the, the very basic elements of this vision, and then I will open the, the, the floor uh, and, and be able to uh, uh, respond to particular questions. I would like this to be more of an engagement rather than a talk. Uh, our vision is, is uh, uh, based on uh, a, a vision of, of Libya uh, that is actually uh, uh, combines a, uh, a, uh, uh, its honor and, and dignity as a sovereign state, a united state, with, a, with its beauty and, and uh, sublime uh, uh, beauty and, and uh, sublime values. Uh, it, is, it has four foundations. Uh, the first is uh, what, what we call Serene Libya, Libya Hania in Arabic. And uh, this, this is a, a vision of a country that uh, lives in, in peace and the security with a unified army uh, based on the five plus five committee work, uh, which we salute here, uh, unified police force, uh, unified uh, border security, and with an independent judiciary that is respected and protected and kept uh, safe from interference by the other arms of, uh, of, of, of government and, and uh, the legislature. Uh, the second uh, foundation is what we call thriving Libya. Uh, in Arabic, it's Libya as Zahira. And it is basically a, a vision of a, a circular economy that is uh, sustainable, sees the uh, uh, focuses on sustainable development with lots of opportunities for young women and, uh, and men uh, through small and uh, medium sized businesses and partnership between the private and the, and the public sector with major uh, reform uh, of the public sector. Uh, digitization and uh, uh, basically trying to be at the forefront of uh, new developments, inclu including uh, communications, blockchain technology for establishing networks of trust and, and, uh, and, and various other uh, uh, solutions uh, that we'll be introducing. The third uh, uh, pillar of this, uh, of, of this vision uh, is what we call Compassionate Libya or uh, Libya Samha. Uh, it's a vision of a compassionate and forgiving Libya uh, 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 with an idea of uh, national reconciliation being uh, foundational. And when we talk of national reconciliation, we mean real national reconciliation based on mutual respect and uh, respecting the grievances and the worries and the, and the fears of others, and not just uh, systems of compensation, uh, as has been uh, unfortunately done for the last uh, few years. Uh, we, we are looking for a, a, a real uh, truth and reconciliation process with uh, deep forgiveness and, uh, and uh, um, amends to the people who have been hurt uh, so that we can have a true uh, national reconciliation. Uh, lastly, the, the fourth uh, uh, pillar is that of a, a clean Libya. Uh, Libya that's clean, uh, not only environmentally, but also clean from violence and clean uh, from uh, corruption which is a real uh, uh, big problem in Libya, a uh, corrosive problem that is like a cancer eating the body politic and the, and the very state, and has led to multiple uh, problems in all the sectors of, uh, of Libya. Uh, we, we look forward to a, a pristine Libya that, is, uh, that will fight corruption and, and uh, uh, organized crime, uh, uh, drug uh, trade, uh, the, the, uh, the, the trade in, in humanity, uh, the tragic, uh, uh, you know, uh, abuse of, of immigrants and, and uh, various um, uh, fragile and vulnerable human beings. So, uh, on the basis of these four pillars, we, we have a, a, a complete uh, vision for the for the country, and its completeness uh, is, is because of its open-endedness and its openness to continuous revision through discussion. 
we do invite you to visit our website and to send us any suggestions. Your suggestions will be incorporated as much as we can in the further attritions of, uh, of the vision. We try to combine uh, throughout the vision uh, rootedness in our uh, long history, diverse history, pluralistic uh, history, uh, respecting all the uh, cultures of Libya, the Amazigh, the Arab, the Tibu, the Tuareg cultures and other cultures. Uh, we also combine this rootedness with openness onto our horizons, the horizon of the Mediterranean. We try to revive our classical heritage of connecting uh, the, the uh, European continent with the African continent. And uh, we also uh, focus our vision on humanity and human, uh, humanism, uh, recognizing that the human being is the, is the uh, center of our vision and the, and the center of, of ultimate value. Uh, and we do recognize that this humanity is 50% uh, uh, women and 50% men. Uh, we have publicly committed uh, to, uh, uh, to making sure that women have uh, at least 50% of all uh, high offices and, and uh, key positions in, uh, in our future government. We also uh, have a youthful vision in that we recognize that Libya is mostly young people, uh, 70 to 80%. And uh, that's why we will uh, be actually uh, appointing young ministers uh, to the tune of 70% of all ministries and high offices to, uh, to, to, young, uh, to young people, women and men. Uh, this is in a nutshell our vision for the country. Uh, I hope you uh, do take the time to study it. We welcome your suggestions. And uh, uh, at this, uh, I will stop and uh, open uh, uh, the floor to uh, any questions you would like to ask. Great, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nayib. Um, that was a, a, a comprehensive opening statement, and I hope to pick up on some of those points. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions, and I'm actually going to try to combine my questions with some of them we are already receiving online. Um, the first question I want to talk about would be concerning the elections themselves, and, I, and as you know, the, the presidential election is scheduled to be on December 24th. What is your assessment about whether the election actually will happen and whether it will happen on time? And, um, and also about your views about the following parliamentary elections, about whether those elections will also happen on time. Um, I think that the, uh, the pulse of the Libyan people is the, uh, is, is the thing to pay most attention to and, and the uh, expressed will of the Libyan people. There have been multiple uh, surveys of uh, public opinion uh, through polling and uh, various other means, uh, online and uh, telephone polling, and various uh, institutions have done that. And the overwhelming majority of the Libyan people uh, in, these, uh, in these polls and public opinion surveys uh, not only say that they uh, want elections, uh, but uh, are, are emphatically insistent on them. Uh, I take great comfort in that because I think it's ultimately the will of the Libyan people that will make sure the elections happen. And uh, we have also seen articulated statements by uh, multiple political parties, over 25 political parties and blocs and youth movements and women unions have expressed themselves multiple times demanding these elections, demanding that they are both parliamentarian and presidential. Uh, we are also comforted by the fact that there is, for the first time, a, a, a total alignment between the will of the Libyan people to have these elections on time and the will of the international community, which has expressed itself in uh, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, uh, the last two of which were quite emphatic about the date and uh, quite emphatic about the fact that the present temporary government uh, ends on December 24th. Uh, and, and cannot have any further legitimacy. The elections are the only means for uh, refreshing and renewing uh, legitimacy. And uh, because of this combined um, uh, union between the uh, will of the Libyan people as expressed by various opinion polls and also the uh, will of the international community as expressed in UN uh, Security Council, uh, resolutions that are binding, and also through the outputs of Berlin 1, Berlin 2, uh, the Paris uh, meeting that just uh, happened uh, last week. Uh, we are quite confident that these elections will happen on time and that they will be both presidential and parliamentarian. Uh, we at Ihya Libya uh, or Reviving Libya uh, uh, movement, we, we feel that it's important for these uh, elections to be simultaneous. And we understand the most important part of uh, being simultaneous is, is, is uh, the president and the parliament 
swearing uh, the oath and their allegiance uh, to the constitutional basis of this country uh, on, on, the, on the same day. Uh, it's very important to prevent a, uh, a gap happening whereby there is a parliament with no president or a president with no parliament, because we have tried this before. And each time there was a parliament without a president, uh, the presidency got canceled somehow or postponed. We feel that uh, checks and balances between the three uh, branches of government are essential to good governance and to democracy. And uh, we feel that uh, part of the reason we have been in almost continuous chaos for the last 10 years or so is the fact that the uh, parliamentarian branch or the legislative branch has uh, made uh, pretenses to the uh, executive branch and have actually interfered in executive governance. And uh, we feel that the separation of powers and the balance between these powers is of, uh, of, of uh, the utmost importance. In uh, 2013, the February committee actually wrote a, a very important document, which has been uh, rendered part of the constitutional declaration through various amendments, in which they did separate these powers and explain them uh, quite clearly. We feel that the elections will happen on time and will produce a fresh parliament and a fresh presidency, uh, both on the same day, uh, because taking oath will happen on the same day. And we feel that, plus an independent judiciary, and we are very proud of our judiciary in Libya, we feel that we will uh, take our first steps to a balanced democracy where nobody can abuse uh, uh, anybody and where the branches of government are kept in check uh, by each other. Great, thank you for that. Um, just sticking with the elections themselves, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, there's a lot of interest in preventing election-related violence. Um, certainly my institute and, uh, and others are very concerned about that. And you as well in your opening remarks talked about election integrity um, and safety. What measures do you think should be taken in order to ensure a peaceful election cycle? Uh, a cycle which begins, of course, not just with election day, but before and after election day. I think there are some measures that are domestic and uh, purely Libyan, and the most important of these is the commitment of local communities. Uh, these electoral centers are always placed in the middle of communities, normally in schools, and it is the responsibility of each community to make sure that, these, uh, that the center in, in its midst is protected and is, 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 uh, is, is kept uh, sanctified from any um, uh, interference or, or violence or, or attempts at sabotage. Uh, communal uh, securing of the uh, electoral points and the communal monitoring of the electoral points is, is of the utmost importance. And uh, also the commitment of, of local um, uh, uh, police, uh, local uh, armed uh, um, Forces, everybody has to chip in and make sure that the elections are secured. Uh, this is at the local level. Um, at the international level, uh, the most important thing is to uh, very vocally, emphatically, clearly, and uh, systematically um, express zero tolerance to, uh, towards any attempt to corrupt these elections or delay them or postpone them or, or uh, uh, basically sabotage them in any way. And uh, the UN has uh, been very clear, uh, the UN Security Council has been, been very clear, the output of the uh, Paris uh, meeting has been very clear that saboteurs of the elections uh, will be held responsible and that sanctions may be implemented against them. This is very, very important, especially when the saboteurs happen to hold high office, uh, be it executive or legislative or advisory. Uh, there should be no tolerance of utterances that are irresponsible or, and that are invoking uh, violence. Over the last week, unfortunately, we've had some express speeches uh, by some politicians who are in power uh, trying to play games with the, with the laws and trying to uh, use a kind of a populist line uh, ent ent enthusing the youths through uh, giveaways and, and trying to uh, get them to agitate against the, the existing laws of, of the elections. This should not be acceptable and should not be tolerated at all. We have also seen people trying to, to redesign the law so that they can uh, fix some mistakes they made by not resigning in time. Uh, th this should not be tolerated. We have also seen a head of an advisory board 
uh, or, or body that is pretending that it's a second legislature and, and trying to even uh, threaten the use of force by saying that he has forces behind him and so on uh, to, to actually intimidate the electoral commission. We've even had uh, some commentators on uh, Clubhouse and, and Facebook and other uh, places uh, directly threatening the, uh, the head of the uh, electoral commission. This kind of behavior should not be tolerated. Uh, platforms like Facebook should monitor for such threatening uh, discourse and should shut down these people. And also people who actually make such utterances should be held responsible legally uh, within Libya and also internationally. I believe a combination of communal commitment uh, to the elections plus international monitoring and implementation of sanctions against people who try to sabotage them are, are, uh, are necessary in order to uh, have timely, uh, transparent, clean, and peaceful elections. Great, thank you for that. Um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks as well, you talked about submitting your papers to become a candidate for the president, the first elected president of Libya. Um, if you were elected, uh, how would you envision your role as the first president and leader of the country? Do you have a general philosophy of leadership? I believe that um, uh, leadership in Libya uh, in this very first presidency has to center around uh, compassion, forgiveness, and reconciliation before anything else. Um, we have been torn apart through a sequence of civil wars that started in 2011 and have been relentlessly continuing. Uh, you know, people always remember the last war, but there have been uh, at least a dozen wars in Libya since 2011. And these wars, wars have, torn, uh, have torn the country apart. They have, they have um, uh, separated, uh, uh, you know, communities. They have separated um, uh, individuals, even within families. And, and this rupture in the social fabric is the most uh, uh, challenging um, problem uh, before the new president. I, I believe that the presidency has to be first and foremost concerned with national reconciliation. A national reconciliation, which is not based on a paint job or a uh, throw money at, uh, at grievances approach, but one that is genuinely based on uh, truth and reconciliation and compassion and trying to uh, amend the, the social fabric through mechanisms that are actually quite known to Libyans. Uh, it's very interesting that for the last 10 years or so, actually almost 11 years, all peace uh, initiatives that have been successful uh, have, have uh, always been based on communally based uh, peace practices that have been inherited for centuries. Uh, elders and notables and uh, tribal elders and uh, uh, wise figures in the communities uh, women uh, also played a very important role in this, uh, have been able to um, uh, broker many peace uh, talks and have been able to achieve peace uh, in, in this uh, vast country of, of, of very deep wounds. We need to tap into these expertise and these, and these wise uh, peacemakers who have not been celebrated enough and who have not been uh, given enough of a chance, unfortunately. Uh, we, we need to invoke their wisdom uh, through uh, uh, committees and, and, uh, and groups of, of reconcilers and, and mediators. Uh, we need to mend the country. And uh, the presidency has to be, before anything else, a mending uh, presidency, a presidency that is based on, on the compassionate uh, re, re, um, uh, uniting of Libya. Uh, through a, 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 a bottom-up approach, through a, a communally-based approach that invokes the best of values that we have. Libya is a very um, deep country with very deep values, values of love and, and compassion and forgiveness and, and reconciliation that when we just need to tap into our values, rediscover our values, re-articulate them, and give them a, a modern form. And, and this is, they have to, basically, we have to revive our uh, peace-loving values and develop a, 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 a situation of, of peace rather than war, of love rather than hatred, of trust rather than fear. And this is the top priority. Of course, it, it cannot just be uh, sentiments or emotions. And there is a lot of very hard work that has to be done on the nuts and bolts of the economy uh, to, to introduce a prosperity for everyone. 
instead of a, a very small elite uh, stealing all the revenue of the country and leaving everybody else hungry, the, the, the country needs to tap into its resources, its vast oil and gas resources and other resources, including solar energy, including wind energy, including uh, uh, various mining uh, uh, riches, including the amazing cultural uh, heritage of Libya, uh, including the most preserved Roman and, and, uh, and uh, Greek antiquities, and, and even prehistoric uh, caves and various other uh, uh, treasures of Libya. We need to invoke all that to introduce a prosperity that will make young people busy with making a living, making new families, uh, creating a, a happy homes and, and happy children uh, who have the top education that they deserve and the top health care that they deserve. It, it, peace making and, and uh, prosperity making through a thriving economy go hand in hand. With, uh, with governance through proper laws and, and uh, the proper implementation of laws and uh, with, with the uh, use of the uh, cutting edge technologies to save time and to leapfrog uh, over the, the, the lost time that we, we have unfortunately lost for the last 50 years. We need to make up time and uh, we need to educate our young women and, and men uh, you know, in the uh, technologies of, of today and of tomorrow and create a, a future together. So to, to summarize, it's basically a presidency that has to be mending through compassionate praxis based on traditional values of this country, values of forgiveness and, and reconciliation, combined with the, uh, the, the foremost technologies of today and, and uh, trying to build a circular uh, economy with, with sustainable development for young women and men in particular so that they can uh, uh, create a new future for the country. Great, thank you. You mentioned earlier that you have your you have this vision which was called Reviving Libya. And I believe the first pillar of that was dealing with the issue of unity. Um, there are various aspects to unity. There are aspects relating to unifying state institutions. There's unifying the people with symbols and within culture and aspirations. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you would put those uh, uh, articles into effect in terms of bringing unity. At the same time, there's been a heavy emphasis of centralization of governments, particularly within Tripoli. And I wondered how you view decentralizing power and diffusing it throughout the rest of the country so the rest of the country shares that power. Thank you for that question, Michael. That's very, very important. You know, uh, our capital is called Tripoli. And it's called Tripoli for a reason. It's three polis, it's three cities. The city of Oyat, the city of Lipsis uh, Magna, uh, and, and the city of Sabrata. And they, and they were combined in a kind of a confederation of cities, and they were called Tripoli. The Cyrenaica, which is in the, uh, the east of Libya, is actually was called the Pentopolis, which is the five cities, because of uh, five classical cities. It is very interesting that in the history of Libya, the polis, or the city-state was the basis of our uh, political praxis for many, many centuries. And not only in classical antiquity, but even in medieval times, even Khaldun talks about this in his uh, famous book, The Muqaddima, or The Prolegomena to History. And if you look at every community in Libya, you will find a, a very rich tapestry, kind of a mosaic of a very color colorful culture at the village level, at the, at the city level, at, at even the street level and, and the, the uh, area uh, level. Even within Tripoli, you know, Tajura has a particular culture, Sugujuma has a particular culture, the old city has a particular culture, and, and so on. The oases of the vast desert, you know, uh, Jarboub or Jalu, and uh, uh, also the, the south, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, small, uh, small towns like Gharifa, for example, or amazingly historical cities like Ghat or like Radames or like Murzuk have vast histories and, and are very worthy of respect. You know, the great cities and towns of the, of the Nafusa mountain with the uh, uh, deep Amazigh uh, culture, the, the uh, Gatrun with its uh, deep Tubu uh, culture, the Tabisti area also, the Tuareg uh, culture in, in, uh, in the uh, uh, southwest of Libya. What we need to do is to respect locality, you know, um, and, and locality is very, very important. We need to actually make sure that most of the governance happens at the local level. And we believe that the way to decentralize Libya is to actually pay attention 
to the historical facts. Respect the locality, respect the particularity, respect the very sensitive and fragile culture of all these communities. Give the budget to the actual uh, municipalities, not to just one individual who can be uh, corrupt and, and, and steal all the money, but to boards of, of uh, municipalities and of villages and of towns so that uh, people can make a collective decision on how to spend their money locally. The central government can have a, a quality assurance role it can have a standards and policies and procedures role. It can have a kind of a monitoring uh, role to make sure that there is equity and that there is fairness and that there is uh, proper public tendering for all the public tenders, that, that the praxis is, is free from corruption and, and uh, 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 marginalization of uh, local minorities. That's the role of central government, but it is not the role of the central government of Libya to dominate everyone's life and to make everyone go to the capital to do even the simplest of things, uh, everybody's passport should reach them in their in their hometown. Uh, and now, you know, with with advanced technology, services and and uh, uh, can, and and all the things that the citizen needs can be delivered very easily at the local level. Uh, if we have strong municipalities, and also if we use the the, the state of the art technologies with networking now and with blockchain technology, with geographic mapping systems, with uh, land registry systems, with the smart contracts, we, we can actually have a, a, a kind of a technologically empowered revival of the polis. Uh, you know, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, uh, saw the little republics as being foundational for true democracy. And if you look at the history of your own country, Michael, if you look at the history of America, you will find that the greatest democratic praxis was in the town hall. It was at the, at the, at the local municipality, at the small villages and towns, and the responsible citizens that got together in order to uh, design their future together and to design their expenditure together. We believe that the centralization of Libyan governance is one of the key reasons for conflict in Libya, including the 2011 conflict and all the conflicts since. We believe that a decentralized model, but with a responsible central government that, that uh, uh, keeps things um, on, on track and keeps uh, uh, at least minimal policies and procedures implemented, standards of health, standards of environmental responsibility, making sure that there's no abuse of our environment and of, 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 of people, uh, I think is, is the right combination. A kind of a decentralized governance plus uh, uh, a kind of a centralized uh, quality assurance uh, is, is I think the way to go in Libya. And I, I believe that uh, there have been some tremendous efforts. There was a study by Brookings on this. There have been also tremendous efforts by uh, Germany and by uh, Holland in particular to help the municipalities. There were also some French and UK projects in this regard. And we have been very proud that, uh, at our television channel, uh, Libya's channel, to host a program called Mautini, which means my home which was based on the municipality. We have been engaging 103 municipalities. We have uh, over 1,200 episodes in which we visited local towns and villages to see what their needs are. And we have been very uh, happy to see that there have been some uh, international assistance programs in this regard. If I do become the president, this is one of our top priorities to make sure that these programs are, are grown into a full-scale localization of governance plus responsible uh, quality assurance by the central government. Perfect, thank you. Um, I want to turn to the issue of transitional justice. You had talked about reconciliation uh, and what that means within the Libyan context. Um, there are some people that say there should be a general amnesty for Libyan, for Libyan so they can move forward, while others are saying it's, that's just relitigating the past and others advocate for a truth and justice center approach um, where perpetrators of human rights abuses are held accountable and victims feel that justice has been served. How do you see this path toward transitional justice in Libya? You know, in, in, in Libya, we've had pockets of justice and we've had very selective justice. And this has been our, I think, uh, biggest uh, issue you know, when, when justice is selective, it's actually injustice. When, when justice is, is um, how can you say, 
attentive to certain grievances while completely uh, being oblivious to other grievances, it's a problem. When we discriminate uh, you know, between the grievances of people, so the dead of some communities are not important and the dead of other communities are of the utmost importance, where the tortured of certain communities are important, but the tortured of other communities are not important, this kind of selectiveness has been deadly for Libya, and it has been the uh, kind of a, a generator of further and further grievances. The most important thing for justice in Libya is equity, parity, and to make sure that there is a single justice for everybody, and that there is no discrimination between victorious cities and defeated cities, between this tribe or that tribe, between that community and that community, uh, between between the 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 the, the victims of, of this war versus the victims of that other war, all the wars were horrendous. All the wars were deadly. All the wars caused losses of life and property and limbs and 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 have caused immeasurable suffering. Libya is a traumatized country. Libya has been suffering from trauma after trauma, and nearly the entire population has been traumatized, and the symptoms of post-traumatic syndrome are actually so prevalent, even in the public discourse. So even if you look at Facebook narratives and, and discourses and analyze them, you can see the symptoms. They are glaringly uh, uh, clear. And there, is, there aren't enough th therapeutic practitioners in Libya. There isn't enough attention to, to therapy in general. The, the country needs a therapeutic uh, approach where we we're, we're actually address this trauma and where we actually address these grievances. And transitional justice should, should be not just a justice of the letter of the law, but of the spirit of the law. And that is a very important uh, 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 point. Uh, so far, we have had a very artificial way of approaching it, a very selective way of approaching it. Uh, you know, truth-finding commissions that begin at a certain date and a cutoff date and forget about the grievances before, or focus on a single city versus uh, the other cities. We need a comprehensive approach where all violations of human rights are treated in, in the same way and are rejected in the same way, where all abuses of human beings are rejected in the same way, where, where justice is done against uh, uh, those who, who perpetuate uh, criminality indiscriminately. And if there is forgiveness and if there is reconciliation, the community that has been grieved has to be given the priority and has to be asked you cannot force forgiveness on people. People have to forgive from the bottom of their heart. And normally people would only forgive if people actually show some degree of repentance or at least express regret over what they have done. So far, unfortunately, for the last decade, our approaches to uh, transitional justice have been very, very selective, very, very narrow-minded and quite superficial. And oftentimes have actually been part of the corruption. So people actually try to uh, assign large sums of money as compensation, and then they ask for compensation for communities who haven't really been injured, and then you'll find it becomes like a spoils of war kind of situation rather than true reconciliation. Reconciliation forgiveness cannot be facile. It cannot just be a blanket, uh, uh, you know, uh, forgiveness check for everyone. There has to be a serious discussion, and, uh, and uh, it's painful, and it will take years, and it will be not so easy, but we need to go through it in order to heal our, our hearts and our minds and to go forward. Great, thank you. I'm gonna turn a little bit now to more foreign affairs and, um, and issues related to foreign fighters. I wonder if you could tell me about how you view what should be done to remove and withdraw foreign fighters from the country. And if you think all foreign fighters should be removed in general. I think that Libya belongs to Libyans. Uh, Libyans are more than capable of defending their own country. Libyans are more than capable of making peace with each other. And the uh, clear and luminescent example is the committee of the five plus five. These are officers from across Libya, east, west, and south, who have been very diligently working at uh, brokering a, 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 not only a ceasefire, but have been able to establish the reopening of roads, and laying a solid foundation for the political life that we are now enjoying. The fact that we are now going to register for presidential elections and parliamentary elections is largely due to the efforts of these uh, soldiers, basically, who sat together and recognized that they're all Libyan 
and that Libya should be uh, our foremost concern over all uh, other concerns, uh, regional or personal or tribal or otherwise. I believe that uh, th this work must be uh, uh, built on. And I, I truly believe that uh, the five plus five work is, is uh, f foundational for, for this uh, piece that, that we seek and for going forward. So in bringing that kind of sense of peace and unity within the country, there's also the issue of the strong influences of the militia. Uh, how should a future leader of Libya dismantle the militia? Uh, how do they look about how to incorporate them or integrate them into the state apparatus? Um, how, how do you envision dealing with this issue? You know, the, the uh, philosophers have always warned about categorization. You know, once you categorize, uh, you can make category mistakes, as some philosophers say, and, and categorization can lead to uh, whole, wholesale judgments that can be quite harsh. Uh, Libya's armed uh, groups um, are, are of a, a tremendous uh, variety. Uh, there are armed groups that are basically just criminal uh, uh, smuggling rings. Uh, there are uh, armed groups that are basically local mafia. There are armed groups that are uh, basically drug uh, 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 mafias. There are um, uh, armed groups that are basically human uh, trafficking uh, concerns. There are so, uh, and, and there are groups that were simply young people trying to defend their streets and their community from the violence that could be uh, uh, perpetrated uh, by others against them. And there are uh, some ideologically based armed groups, uh, religiously based armed groups. So it's very important to do a typology of these groups, to study them very carefully, and to dismantle them very carefully, uh, integrating some of the uh, young people in these armed groups into the army and the police in a systematic way after proper vetting and after proper training, completely uh, rejecting any armed groups that uh, have ter terrorist leanings or are ideologically uh, uh, radically uh, based. Uh, other groups uh, can be negotiated with and uh, basically being uh, restructured so that they can uh, do other things in life. You know, the fact that we, for young, many young people, there are no opportunities in Libya except by carrying a gun and, and getting a big salary uh, by, by killing other Libyans. Uh, it's very important to give opportunities. The giving of, of new opportunities for young people is, is of crucial importance for the dismantling of these uh, armed groups. There isn't a single blanket uh, solution for, for uh, the armed groups uh, problem. Uh, there, there needs to be a, a typology, and there have been many mapping uh, exercises that have just not been used by the successive governments, unfortunately. Uh, many countries have actually helped by mapping these uh, armed groups and trying to uh, do DDR properly and, and trying to advise, but have not been listened to. I think we need professional advice on this. And we need to all cooperate. It has the solutions have to be ultimately community-based, and they have to be based on the rebuilding of the Libyan army, uh, a united army, an army that doesn't belong to a certain person or a certain family or a certain tribe or a certain political party or a certain ideological line or a certain uh, region. An army that is able to defend Libya, and, and forgive me, I didn't address the foreign fighters uh, issue, uh, an army that will, will make sure that there is no need for any foreign fighters. Libya should have no foreign fighters, uh, whether they are, uh, how can you say, regular forces or mercenaries. All foreign forces, all foreign fighters have to leave Libya uh, from all regions of Libya. And this has been bravely articulated by the five plus five. I began to speak about them and then I, I, uh, I, I maybe truncated the discourse too short. It is the five plus five work that will lead to the exiting of all these forces. But we need help. And the help we need has to be collective help. It cannot be one country helping us at the cost of other countries. It has to be an international uh, based help, a UN based help. And, and uh, th this help needs to 
uh, uh, keep the pressure on. In Paris, the outcomes were very, very important, and everybody was very clear that everybody has to leave, all foreign forces and all foreign mercenaries have to leave. It is most unfortunate that Turkey decided to put a little star and to put a condition on the Paris uh, outputs. Uh, we, we believe that Turkey uh, is an important player in the region, but that Turkey has better chances of having better relations with Libyans and safeguard its economic interests in Libya if it actually takes away all the mercenaries and the, and the forces that has brought into the country, just as other countries have to do the same from the east and from the south, from all, all parts of Libya. There can be no selectiveness about this. All foreign forces, all foreign fighters, all mercenaries have to leave from all regions of Libya, all parts of Libya, and a united Libyan army has to be established based on the 5 plus 5 initiative. And by the way, that initiative was based on at least six sessions in Egypt of, of very difficult negotiations. But I really salute these Libyan officers from across the nation who have been able to build a solid basis for a unified Libyan army and an army that, inshallah, will, will, or God willing, will be able to defend the country in a united way not politicized army, an army that can actually make sure that no foreigners, uh, uh, fighters, I mean, foreign fighters or mercenaries ever set foot on our soil. So uh, this is our approach to this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I, I've kind of gone through my list of questions, and I'm going to turn more to what uh, the questions we are getting in our chat room. Um, and we have received a lot of questions with regard to the, uh, regard to the candidacy of Saeed Al Islam Gaddafi. Um, and people are asking about your views on his candidacy. Should he be allowed to go forward with, uh, with uh, accusations of, uh, from the International Criminal Court on him? Um, how do you see his candidacy? How should, we, how should this be judged? Libya is a sovereign state, it's a united sovereign state, and it has an independent political will. Libya's laws are the laws enacted by its legitimate parliament, duly elected by the Libyan people. What I say about this case and all other cases, including myself and any other candidate, is that everybody must be subject to Libyan laws thoroughly. It is Libyan laws that will decide who participates and who doesn't, who is excluded and who is, isn't, and we must all abide and respect these Libyan laws. I believe that the laws are sufficiently rigorous and that the uh, Electoral Commission is sufficiently independent and fair. And I believe that the Libyan judiciary is a trustworthy body. And I believe that there are enough um, clauses of the laws that will determine the particulars of any particular candidate, whether he can run or he can't run. We all submitted our papers, and I'm sure that there are more people who will submit their papers. And uh, Saif al-Islam also submitted his papers. These papers will be scrutinized, including my papers, including the papers of all the, uh, the defined people who submitted uh, today and yesterday in Tripoli and previous days, and in Benghazi. And all, everybody's papers will be submitted. And I am sure, as, as we hear, the commission will send them to, to the judiciary, to the public prosecutor, to the taxation offices, to the immigration offices. And they will do their thorough investigation according to Libyan laws. They will do the vetting. This vetting must be accepted by all Libyans. And it's very important that we are all peaceful. I commit myself, if I'm excluded for any reason by the Electoral Commission, to respect that decision. Even if I feel grieved, I can, have, I can appeal. And if that appeal is struck down, I will accept the judgment of the Commission and of Libyan judiciary. Everybody must respect the law. If we make it and put it in that objective and neutral way and not personalize it, it isn't, we should not be using the law against people that we dislike or, or feel uncomfortable with. We should try to make sure that the institutions are respected and their judgments are respected. And through that, we take the personalization out of it. We take the vehemence and the hatred out of it, and we make it all very objective. So my answer, my long answer to, to your question is, he applied, let the commission do its work, respect its decision, positive or negative on any of us. And if we do that, and we support the electoral commission and the Libyan judiciary and the Libyan parliament, and by the way, that parliament is a single chamber parliament. The, the state council is not a second chamber. 
and the laws of the Libyan parliament must be respected as they are. Great, thank you for that. Um, I received this question, and I'll read it to you. It's Dr. Aris. As a Muslim scholar and thinker, do you think the problem with, West, with the Western model of democracy in Islamic nations is due to the Islamist groups and the Muslim Brotherhood, or does it have something to do with Islam itself? Do you agree that Islam, although it is a religion, it has ideological aspects? That's a very complex question. What I can tell you is, is the following. If you look at the constitution of Medina, which is a, a, a very interesting document um, uh, produced during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, at, at the establishment of the very first uh, Muslim polis, uh, the Medina, Medina Munawwara. Um, if we look at that constitution, and you look at the, what Jefferson uh, wrote many centuries after regarding uh, small communities and the commitment of communities uh, to all its members and the, and the responsibility for the mutual respect and mutual defense within communities, you can see that Jeffersonian democracy uh, is, is actually quite uh, reconcilable and is quite consistent with many of the very deep values in, in Islam. Uh, Libya is a, uh, is a Maliki nation historically, uh, Maliki jurisprudence. Uh, the Amazigh communities in the mountain are Ibadi communities, but both the Maliki and the Ibadi school have very deep uh, roots in jurisprudence. And our uh, political jurisprudence is actually very democratic. It's actually, if you look very carefully at uh, the, the juridical basis of our uh, communities, you will find that they, there is no contradiction between them and, and democracy in any uh, way, shape, or form. And this is not a coincidence, because Jefferson's ideas were, as you know, built on, on uh, previous uh, uh, scholars like uh, uh, Locke, and, and the entire, actually, Enlightenment uh, has, has to do with Andalusia, ultimately. And Andalusia was also a Maliki. Uh, so th there are actually historical ligaments uh, for, for this similarity. What I'm trying to say, uh, lack of democracy has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, tyranny and, and, uh, and fascism have to do with the imposition of a human ego on other human beings. And tyrannical tendencies are present in all cultures and in the history of all nations. In the 1920s and 30s, Europe saw the rise of fascist groups in Spain and Italy and in Germany with, with catastrophic uh, results for all of humanity. And it's a, 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 a historical fact that there are tyrannical tendencies. I refer again to Hannah Arndt in her beautiful book on totalitarianism. She explains the dynamic. Also, if you look at the writings of Eric Fromm on, on uh, Escape from Freedom and, and how it happens, you can see that these mechanisms for, for tyranny are actually uh, uh, indiscriminate. They, have, they can be present in a, a Muslim culture, in a Christian culture, in a Hindu culture, in a Buddhist culture. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the imposition of ego and also of certain elites and cliques and groups wanting to monopolize all power to themselves and to, and, and to basically become a state within the state. Uh, the fact that a democracy has been crippled uh, after the Arab Spring has a lot to do with these fascist tendencies. And these fascist tendencies are present in multiple ways. I've actually written about this in a book called Radical Engagements, and you can read further on it. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a historical phenomenon, and it leads to what we call the tyranny of the minority, where a small minority actually monopolizes the state, especially, tries, especially if it gets its hands on its coffers, as has happened in Libya, where the central bank of, of Libya has been uh, basically uh, monopolized for the last decade. And it uses its uh, privileged status to actually dominate everybody else. The, the need for presidential elections in Libya and the need for a fresh parliamentarian set of elections is, is precisely to break the tyranny of the minority and to actually have the rule of the majority that still respects the minority without the tyranny of the majority, but we really need to get away from the tyranny of the minority. Now, there have been very clever ways of imposing tyranny of the minority lately. One of them is to demand consensus on everything, what we call in Arabic tawafuq. So people say, we can't have elections because there is no tawafuq, there is no consensus. Well, if a small minority 
uh, like really dozens of people, not more, insist on being consulted and insist on having a veto on the will of the entire Libyan people, it's not exactly democracy, is it? It becomes a form of tyranny uh, hidden under the, the velvety words like uh, consensus and like and, and, the, and the Arabic tawafuq. So um, I believe it has, tyranny has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with Buddhism or with Hinduism. Tyranny has to do with human ego that imposes itself on fellow human beings and that actually violates the most important thing, which is the dignity and the inherent value of the human being. Immanuel Kant, you know, the great German philosopher, says that there is a difference, very simple difference between things and persons. Things are for others. So you can use them as tools, you can, you can use a thing. But persons are in themselves. They have to be respected as having inherent value. And I believe that democracy is based on this idea, based on the idea that the human being is inherently valuable. And this is a basic Muslim idea because it is precisely what, the, what we call in Arabic hurmat al-insan, al-hurma, you know, which is the sanctity of the human being. And democracy is based on this idea. This is a very basic and fundamental idea. But if we have thorough respect for human rights, human dignity, human value, then we will have a democracy. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Nye. Uh, that was a, uh, an expansive response and one that we're going to end on today. We've actually reached the end of our hour together, and I appreciate your time and for your, uh, for your comprehensive answers to our many questions. And, of course, we all wish you the best of, uh, for the future. And I also want to thank uh, my team here at USIP for helping to put this together, uh, this event and this series. We hope others will join us in future series uh, and interviews as we continue to talk to the leaders of Libya. So again, Dr. Nayed, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, listening and, th and thank you for your engaging questions and thank you for your time and thank you for this platform. I look forward to hearing, to, uh, uh, hearing what other candidates have to, uh, to say. And uh, this is really a great uh, platform. And thank you very much for uh, setting it up. Thank you.